Welcome to the third edition of the Siri Designs Q&A. I'm Sharif Asiri, and I'll be answering some of the questions that you've left for me in the comments. In this Q&A, we'll be talking about a wide range of topics, including hemp-based insulation, double wall systems, air barriers, vapor retarders, and more. I very much appreciate all the comments that you've left for me in the previous video. We're definitely going to continue with these Q&As once a month, so leave a comment below if you want a chance for them to be featured in the next video. Without further ado, let's get started. So the first question that we have is about double walls and air barriers. Uh, the question is, double 2x4 wall system, I've decided that this is the most cost-effective route for me to go. With that, can the vapor retarder go on the back side of the interior frame? and still insulate the inside frame. That way it minimizes air penetrations. Note, I'm in Alaska. Side question, any recommendations for a cost-effective ceiling assembly to minimize air penetrations like that as well? By the way, really appreciate you guys. Just simple, great information. Thank you so much, we appreciate your comment. So in answer to your first question, you absolutely can install that smart vapor retarder on the back side of the interior frame. Um, that's actually a strategy that's commonly used in uh, double wall construction, but sometimes instead of a smart vapor retarder, they'll use taped OSB. And that way it provides the benefits of an air barrier and also a vapor throttle, so it slows down vapor into that wall assembly to make sure that it, you're not inundating um, either the backside of the sheathing or the backside of the drywall with moisture, whichever way that vapor drive is moving in. So yes, you can absolutely install on the backside of the interior frame. You are absolutely correct that this reduces penetrations in that membrane, and that can be highly beneficial if you don't want to install the horizontal strapping that's typically installed over a smart vapor retarder membrane or air barrier. And so um, this would be one way to condense that wall assembly. I, I have no issues with it whatsoever. You can also use that interior wall as somewhat of a service cavity that's insulated. You'll still have to probably bore through some of those interior studs to run your services and you know plumbing runs and stuff, but as long as it's close to the interior, you're really not going to have too many issues. So. Uh, make sure that layer is airtight. You don't have to use a smart vapor retarder. You can use uh, OSB or, or taped sheathing instead, but um, this would work completely fine. As for your side question about any recommendations for a cost-effective ceiling assembly um, to minimize penetrations, I'm assuming you're talking about a vented roof assembly, and I don't know about whether this is necessarily cost-effective, but it will definitely eliminate a lot of the penetrations in that ceiling assembly. Um, the first strategy that you can use is just to frame out a soffit or a dropped ceiling, and that way you have this airtight service cavity in which you can run your electrical, um, if you have a sprinkler system you can run it through there, and it's basically a dropped ceiling. Not always the most cost effective, um, but it works pretty well to house your mechanicals, your HVAC runs, your duct work, and all that stuff without penetrating the air barrier. You can frame out some ceiling joists on top of the walls and sheathe over them and tape the sheathing so you basically are framing out like a box. And then you're installing your, uh, your rafters or your trusses over that. Um, and insulating above that and venting that roof. And so basically you have this airtight service cavity that's created by those ceiling joists. And then on top of that, um, you have the vented roof. So um, those two spaces are essentially uncoupled from each other. There's no communication between the outside and the inside. And that's really what we want. And it's airtight. So um, that has worked fairly well. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's absolutely worth it if you're able to plan ahead. These were excellent questions. Thank you so much. The next question that we have is concerning hemp fiber insulation. Uh, the question is, I recommend considering hemp fiber insulation alongside mineral wool, one brand rock wool, with similar qualities and benefits. I'm planning to build a hemp crete home and will use hemp fiber bats in the ceiling and crawl space smiley face. I don't have a problem with hemp insulation or hemp crete. It's a fairly smart insulation material. Personally, I've never specified it before just because that's the market that we're in, but it is a growing market and I've received a lot of comments um, asking about it and promoting it. Um, so, you know, I don't really have strong opinions on it as long as it's kept dry, that's really what matters. Um, hemp being a natural fiber is a lot more prone to mold growth, right? So mold, you know, they, it wants to grow on anything organic that it can eat. And so just like wood fiber insulation, um, you have to be a little bit more careful about how you use it 
Same thing with cellulose. Obviously all these insulation materials are treated in a way where they try to remove the stuff that mold wants to eat and they add things like paraffins and other stuff to make it a little bit more resistant to moisture and, and mold growth. I'm not sure if that's the same thing for hemp fiber, but I assume this is probably the case. Um, with regard to hemp fiber, as you mentioned, it's similar in the way that rock wool functions and cellulose and other materials like that function. It's going to be relatively vapor open. Um, it's probably going to be air permeable, which means that you have to have an air barrier in there or you have to install it on the outside of the sheathing. So, um, you know, be very careful about how you use it, but it should perform well if it's in, located in the right spot and if you're controlling moisture. If you're installing hemp fiber bats in the ceiling, you need to, um, if it's a vented roof, that's fine. Just vent, for, vent the roof and provide your air barrier at the ceiling plane. If you're building a conditioned roof and you're using hemp fiber bats, you want to treat this exactly like you would treat uh, mineral wool or wood fiber bats. Um, you need to have uh, some rigid insulation installed outboard or a smart vapor retarder on the inside um, to prevent condensation on the backside of that sheathing. As for the crawl space, uh, it depends on how your crawl space is insulated and how it's designed. Um, you don't want condensation occurring on the walls of the crawl space, and whether you're designing a conditioned crawl space or a uh, vented crawl space, that'll determine how uh, those hemp fiber bats perform. So um, you need to consider all these things when specifying it, but overall, I don't inherently see an issue with it. Feel free to use it. Thanks for the question. All right, the next question that we have is about insulating an old attic. The question is, I have an old house with five inch rafters and the third floor is an attic conversion. The slanted roof gets hot to the touch in the summer, zero insulation, no soffit vents, blocking at the top of the pony walls, preventing any airflow to the ridge. I've been leaning towards spray foam to get the air seal and the R value without having to vent. I'd also like a condition the top attic space to add AC. Any recommendations? I'm hoping to add insulation exterior eventually, but not immediately. I'm in Seattle, which is climate zone four. All right, so you have several options here. As you already alluded to, it sounds like you recognize that adding exterior rigid insulation is probably gonna be the best thing for that roof assembly. I would not recommend spray foam just because I've had a lot of issues with it in the past. And you can go and watch several videos that are already on the channel. And in fact, the last Q&A video, uh, I discussed why I'm not really a big fan of spray foam and I've gone into more detail on why that is as far as some off-gassing issues as well as some cracking issues, which has an impact on how well that air seals. Um, so not gonna recommend spray foam for this application, but I would recommend that you consider waiting a little bit longer until you reach a point where you can install rigid insulation and that way you're going to have a really long lasting well performing roof assembly as far as a new roof assembly which integrates this rigid insulation i would install a new layer of sheathing and then apply a self-adhered vapor permeable membrane or i would use the you know huber zip sheathing with taped joints but essentially we want something that's going to serve as an air barrier and a water control layer at that layer and then we install the rigid insulation above that uh, to warm the condensing surface of that sheathing. And then installed over that, we have a choice of either uh, installing um, a standing seam metal roof over furring strips, or if shingles are desired, you install another layer of sheathing, the underlayment, and then your uh, courses of shingles. So, you know, there's several options at your disposal as far as what types of rigid insulation that you can install above the roof deck, but that's really the best option here apart from just leaving it as is. Now, I don't know the shape of this attic and whether this is gonna be feasible or not, but if you're tight on the budget, something that you can do is you can insulate interstitially between the rafters with some bat insulation, staple a smart vapor retarder membrane like in Tello, and tape all the joints to provide the benefits of an air barrier and a vapor retarder, and then install a vapor diffusion port at the ridge, and then that way you'll address air control and condensation with that smart membrane. If it gets wet, it can dry to the interior or out through that vapor diffusion port while remaining airtight and so you know I, I would have to take a look at your roof assembly before I gave you an answer but that could be a potential solution if the rigid insulation was not in the budget hopefully this answers your question I know it's a little bit open-ended thanks so much for the comment and good luck all right our next question is about building a house that will last for centuries so the question is 
I would like to build a house that could be expected to last centuries. What type of wall system is the most durable? Does insulation come at the cost of durability? All right, this is actually a really straightforward and easy solution. The best type of wall assembly that I would construct if I wanted uh, a wall assembly to last for centuries would be a, per a variation of the perfect wall. So for those who are unfamiliar, the perfect wall was coined by Joe Stebrick from Building Science Corporation, but he kind of took it from an older engineer and the whole concept is that you have your structure on the inside, you have all your control layers, the water, air, and vapor control layer on the outside, and then on the outside of that you have your thermal control layer or your insulation. And so what this does is that it keeps the structure and the moisture sensitive components at the same temperature and relative humidity conditions as the interior space. And you never receive condensation or if there are moisture issues they just dry very easily back to the interior. Uh, the insulation protects the water control layer, the air control layer, and it provides a lot of redundancy to that wall assembly by having all the control layers on the outside of the structure. There are a lot of durability benefits to having a variation of the perfect wall. Now, if I wanted it to last for centuries, uh, you probably could have a wood frame structure last for centuries. It's been done and we have a lot of examples of that. But if someone came to me saying they wanted to build a house that would last for 100 years, 300 years, 500 years, I would tell them that we need to start with a concrete block wall or CMU or cast in place concrete as the structural core of that. Then on the outside, I would apply a fluid applied water and air control layer that was vapor permeable, but not too vapor open, not too vapor closed. We want it just right. So maybe around 10 perms. On the outside of that, I would install several thick layers of rigid rock wool insulation. And that way that provides this hydrophobic, vapor open, uh, uh, moisture resistant and bug resistant insulation, right? Bugs are gonna eat rigid foam and other things like that. Bugs are not gonna eat mineral wool. And so uh, I would use rigid mineral wool on the outside and then I would install a solid brick cladding that's ventilated. And that way that's gonna be protecting all of those components behind it. And, um, you know, we have examples of these types of walls that have been built. We're just modifying it a little bit to make sure that uh, it's comfortable and stays moisture resistant. As for the interior side, what I would do is I would probably coat that interior side in a plaster or stucco, or I would install a steel framed interior um, partition with some Dens Armor Plus, which is a fiberglass matte faced gypsum product and that way it's not going to have any paper facers that could provide um you know a food source for mold if it ever was to grow there but it's probably not so uh that would be my perfect wall if i wanted it to last for centuries you can make this work perfectly well with a wood frame structure you can make it work with a steel frame structure. So there's a lot of ways to achieve the perfect wall. Uh, this is just one of them and it'll last for quite a long time. Thanks so much for the comment. All right, our last comment is about low sloped roofs, rock wool insulation, and maintaining water and air control continuity. The question is, I have a project in climate zone 6A. As I agree with you on spray foam, it is not recommended. I use rock wool insulation almost exclusively. My current project has a complete exterior insulation blanket of six inches, including the foundation on the outside. The roof will also receive exterior tapered insulation. The west elevation sees the lake breeze every day as it's very near the shoreline. Flat roof modern design with an eight foot overhang on the west and north sides, that's pretty good. The roof has two other elevations and flat roofs. As the space will have access from the second level, it also will need railings. My question is about detailing the overhangs and how to set up the drainage and maintain all of the control layers. Do you suggest draining to an external gutter on the fascia or put up a short parapet wall to direct to a scupper? We'll need structure to locate the railing that will not interfere with the thermal control layers. What would be the best approach in this situation? This is, uh, this is a tougher detail and I do get a lot of questions about conditions like this. So I think it's perfect that we'll, we'll address it here. So with regard to maintaining air control continuity, all right, when you're designing a flat roof, you wanna make sure that the air barrier is installed over the decking. Whatever is serving as your decking, uh, a lot of people in residential will just use um, OSB or plywood, and that needs to connect to the air barrier at the walls. 
before any parapets, before anything goes up, before the rigid insulation goes up. And that's basically to prevent all the warm, moist air from migrating up into the flat roof assembly and getting trapped underneath the impermeable roof membrane. Remember, a lot of flat roof membranes are highly vapor impermeable. They're uh, strong vapor retarders. So things like EPDM, TPO, PVC, modified bitumen, all those are very strong vapor retarders, and in cold climates like the one that you're located in, you're going to have a very uh, large temperature gradient between the exterior environment and the interior condition space. And so all that warm, moist air is going to want to travel upwards and migrate upwards through air leakage and diffusion and make its way to the outside, but it'll get trapped if it gets in there. So we want a very strong air barrier at, on top of the decking, and that air barrier should also be a very decent vapor retarder as well. So that air barrier and vapor retarder needs to lap over the exterior walls or connect to the exterior walls in some way. When you have an overhang, this makes it a little bit more difficult because you have to provide that continuity from uh, the roof down over the overhang and down to the exterior walls, or you need to interrupt it somehow on the interior by providing some uh, sealed blocking or sealed rigid insulation that bridges the gap between the underside of that decking or sheathing and the top plate. If you're using a corrugated steel deck, you have to install uh, something like a gypsum cover board over that, and then your self-adhered membrane goes over that, um, just because you can't install a self-adhered membrane, keep it airtight when it's over corrugated steel decking. All right, so we've t addressed air control. You have those two options, either lap it over you know, the entire overhang and uh, uh, provide an air seal that way or provide the air seal at the top plate of the exterior walls uh, so that can be a little bit more complicated as for water control continuity and the railings you have several options the first option that you have is you can either have a fascia mounted railing system that you design with the gutter system in mind to make sure that the railing system doesn't uh, interfere with that gutter system and then that way all of the water just drains to that gutter the other option is that you can build a parapet wall. You can either combine that with an internal gutter or with uh, a scupper or a roof drain. I actually prefer roof drains in these types of cases because we don't have to worry about any kind of penetrations through the parapet wall and we don't have to worry about designing a custom profile for a fascia mounted railing system that uh, meets code and everything because you're, you're limited to the gap size between the fascia and the, the railing system. So um, there are several options that you have there. I would say try to go for a roof drain if possible um, with an emergency uh, overflow drain as well. Those are pretty standard and they come as a pair usually. Now as far as the thermal control layer, uh, with regard to the rigid insulation, you're going to have to accept that you'll have a few thermal bridges in there. We do have some details on the website that discuss this uh, as well as on the flat roof guide uh, which is available on my website. Um, but I would be more than happy to talk about this more in depth in another video because this seems to be a common problem and we tend to see more and more uh, roof decks nowadays. So um, we'll perhaps address this in another video in the future. Um, thanks so much for your comment. I really appreciate it. If you want your comment featured in the next Q&A, please do leave it in the comments section below. Leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And head over to siri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics, including flat roofs and some of the stuff we've already talked about in this Q&A and other Q&As, but just more in depth. Let me know what you want to see in the weeks and months ahead, and I'll see you in the next video. Good luck with your projects. Cheers.